Okay, so welcome to the Growing an ABCD Symposium. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The city of Brantford and the surrounding area is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral people. Over the next three days, we will be sharing stories and learnings from one another with a focus on asset-based community development. From what I have read and learned, the traditional Indigenous communities, this was a natural way of life for many. We have so much we can learn from Indigenous stories and teachings. In our community, we have so many assets and gifts that can help us with this. Places like the Mohawk Institute, Woodland Cultural Centre, and many Indigenous services that hold events regularly. Many of those are open to the public if you keep your eye open for them. Uh, we also have a responsibility to take this learning into our own hands and even take roles of allyship to help others learn and grow. ABCD looks at the challenges that many systems have and how as citizens we can work and care together to make our communities better. I would like to thank the Indigenous folks that have been drawing attention to these systemic challenges for decades. Thank you as well for the use of this beautiful, beautiful Turtle Island and for the many gifts that have been bestowed upon us. Things much like the Grand River, which is right across the road and hopefully we will be enjoying this week. So we actually had an opening from an Indigenous elder, uh, Peter Isaacs. Unfortunately, he's unwell today and couldn't make it, but we really appreciate him taking the, taking the time and saying that he could be here if the circumstances have been different. Um, but I will turn it over to Mandy to do the opening. Hi everybody, welcome. This is the first of three days of community celebration and community building. We welcome you all gathered here with us and those joining us virtually. We know you are in for a special morning and if you stick with us, a special three days. We are thankful for the group of community partners and wonderful citizens that have made today possible. We truly appreciate the city of Brantford for making the space available to us. We also wanted to acknowledge the Trillium Foundation for its financial support of prolonging Brant, thus making these three days possible together. Before we introduce our keynote speaker, we wanted to draw your attention to a few things. So washrooms and a refill water station are just outside the door, just follow the signs to the left of the washrooms. On your table, you will find uh, cue cards and markers and pens. These are for sharing what's, what is growing for you, which is our theme. Um, do you have any ideas that are sprouting? Have any seeds been planted? Are you feeling curious or excited? Let us know and then place the cards in the ideas that sprouted bag at the registration table. Up on the wall at the back, there is a big long paper for us to doodle and draw what's growing as we, as we journey th through these three days. If you are joining us online, you can also share in the chat things that are sprouting for you. There will be an opportunity to gather back together Tuesday, May 17th for a community conversation from 3 to 4.30 p.m. The details to register are up on the slides and at the welcome table or just come chat with any of the Belonging Brant, for, uh, belonging Brant team. During the time we will consider, during that time we will consider the harvest from this week, and see what, see what we want, water. To <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, during this time we will consider the harvest from this week and see what we want to water and grow further. Now, uh, please join me in welcoming Risha Burke to introduce our keynote speaker. Awesome, it's happening, we're here. And, uh, and John is with us. Um, <clears throat> so it is my true pleasure to introduce John McKnight. Um, he was raised as a wandering Ohioan. Ohioan. Is that how you say that, John? Um, having lived there um, in <clears throat> excuse me, seven different neighborhoods and small towns in the 18 years before he left to attend Northwestern University um, in Illinois. And there he had a good fortune to be educated by a faculty dedicated to preparing students for effective citizenship. You're going to hear that word a lot for the next three days, citizens. 
Um, he graduated into the U.S. Navy, uh, where he had three years of postgraduate education in Asia during the Korean War. He's a man of, of many travels. John returned to Chicago and began working for several activist organizations, including the Chicago Commission for Human Relations, the first municipal right, um, civil rights agency. There he learned the Alinsky trade called community organizing. That, this was followed by the directorship of the uh, Illinois American Civil Liberties Union, where he organized local chapters throughout the United States. When John Kennedy was elected president, McKnight was recruited into the federal government where he worked with a new agency that created the um, Affirmative Action Program. Later, he was appointed to the Midwestern, or the Midwest Director of the United States Commission on Civil Rights where he worked with local ci civil rights and neighborhood organizations. In 1969, John McKnight, alma mater, um, Northwestern University, invited him to return and help initiate a new department under the Center for Urban Affairs. This was a group of international um, or interdisciplinary um, faculty doing research designed to support urban change agents and progressive urban policy. John's appointment was an act of heroism on the part of the university as it gave him a tenured prof um, professor professorship, though he had only a bachelor's degree. Way to go, John. Way to break the rules there. That's awesome. Well, at the center um, and a successor, the Institute for Policy Research, John and a few of his colleagues focused their research on urban neighborhoods. The best known results of his work was the formulation and understanding of neighborhood focused, neighborhoods focused on the usefulness of local resources, capacities, and relationships. This work was documented in a guide titled Building Communities from the Inside Out. And it described an approach to community building that became a major development strategy practiced in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, a Asia, Australia. And as an aside, it was during this time that John was one of the trainers of Barack Obama as he learned the skills of community organizing. John is also the author of The Careless Society, a classic critique of professionalism and social services, and a celebrated a celebration of communities' ability to heal themselves from within. Um, he's co-author of Building Communities from the Inside Out with Jody Kretzman, The Abundant Community with Peter Block, and, uh, and Another Kingdom with Peter Block and Walter um, Brueggemann. Currently, he is a co-founder co of the Assets Based Community Development Institute and a senior associate with the Kettling Foundation. John has written just another book that comes out in September. So there's a plug for your book with Cormac Russell. Um, he just never stops. I first heard um, John McKnight in probably 1991 when I was in grad school. And I thought I knew what I was going to study. I thought I knew the future of my, my profession and the change that day. And uh, when I heard all the foundations of assets based community development, and I'm Really thankful for that day, and I've heard John a few times since, and I know you're going to love what John has to share with us. He's an incredible storyteller. Um, he's going to make all this really real for you, really concrete, and I know you're going to be inspired. So we're going to turn it over to John. You're muted, John. All right, I'll start over. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm really pleased to be uh, able to share with uh, about people from Canada. I've spent a lot of my life in Canada. I've been in uh, from the Skeena River Valley up in northern British Columbia over to Antigonish in, uh, in Nova Scotia and uh, everywhere that I go, I realize how different Canada is from the United States. Uh, Canada is what the United States would be like if the United States were a reasonable place. And uh, so I have learned over and over again from you about the nature of cooperation as against uh, hyper uh, uh, competition. 
And I have also learned from uh, you, <clears throat> in the United States, uh, we have something called Americanization classes. And most people who are seeking to be legal citizens uh, take these Americanization classes, which assumes that there is an American. <laughs> Well, what I learned in Canada is that Canada has a different idea than uh, uh, we do here. And it is the idea of a mosaic that what we're trying to do is not make everybody like everybody else. But what we're trying to do is to make beauty out of our differences. And I just have to congratulate all of you being from a country that has perhaps done a better job of that than almost any other. So I wanna start by thanking you for all I've learned from being in, I suppose, 40 different communities across Canada over the years. Uh, we're gonna to try to talk about something uh, called asset-based community development. And people always say, well, what does that mean? And uh, the, um, no, wait here, <laughs> I'm not, I don't want one yet, I'll tell you <laughs> um, that, um, What it means, I think, is better explained by a story, uh, perhaps, than a chart. And so let me tell you uh, A, B, C, D story. Uh, I have spent a fair amount of time in Ireland and in the west of Ireland, the little villages there. I love it there. I'm, uh, I'm an Irish. American anyway, and so it seemed like going home. And uh, one time, I, uh, with uh, my wife, we rented a little cottage in a little town. Town probably had 20 houses, one, one church, and a store. And I loved to fish. So uh, I um, noticed that there was a, a little lake outside of town. And I always carry a collapsible fishing rod and, and then a reel with me. So I decided I would try to fish that lake in this little town, but I didn't have any bait. So I walked over to the little store and had a path and I walked up the path into the store and uh, inside was a older gentleman and uh, I said to him, sir, I, I'd like to buy some bait if I could. And he said to me, uh, what do you mean bait? And I said, well, like worms. And he looked at me for a long time, unbelieving. And he said, Sonny, if you'll just go back out of my store and you see that path that you walked up to come in here, there are four big whitewashed stones on, on either side of that path. And I think if you turn any of those stones over, you'll find all the, the worms that you need. What a great lesson, right? And the lesson he was teaching was, I went to buy something when it was in fact all around me for free. And ABCD is about, what is it that is all around us that is free that we can use to make our communities richer, more powerful, more inclusive, et cetera. So that's what I'd like to uh, share with you, uh, sort of 
take a flashlight and show you a path that will uh, lead to much stronger local communities. And I'm not thinking about Toronto. I'm thinking about a neighborhood, four blocks, five blocks. Small is beautiful, and we're focused at at that level. So um, we would start, I think, by saying that there are some things that people in a neighborhood can uniquely do that no system or institution can do. Now, if the people aren't organized to do what only they can do, then they will, will complain and uh, say the institutions aren't doing what they should do. But we start with the idea that neighborhoods have work to do and they need to be organized in order to do that work. So we did a lot of research ask, uh, asking in neighborhoods what kinds of activities people engaged in. And we finally concluded that there are seven kinds of, of activities that uh, they engaged in. Uh, we call them functions. Seven functions that neighbors are the only people who can fulfill. It is the work of people in a neighborhood, these seven functions. So. Can you put the seven functions up on the screen? First, the first slide. John, can you just give us a minute? Cause I'm gonna, gonna switch who's gonna um, share the slides. Just we're having trouble with the smart bird here. So we have to disconnect. So Hank, don't, so stay where you are. Everything's good, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. This is a, the advantage of having face-to-face -face meetings <laughs> rather than uh, depend on the technology. There we are. All right, good. Can can everybody hear me? Sound still working? All right. So here is a list of seven functions that we think neighborhood people have work to do if they're to be fulfilled. And if they in a neighborhood, if you don't fulfill these functions, then your neighborhood is going to be filled with problems and issues. So the functions that only we can really do are first health. Health, uh, if you ask an epidemiologist, what, uh, uh, what percentage of people's health is the result of medical systems? In general, they will say 15, 16%, which means that 85% of what makes you healthy is not the medical system. Well, what is it? It is mostly what happens in your neighborhood. It is uh, what, you do as individuals, uh, what do you eat? <laughs> what do you drink? Uh, 
How much exercise do you get? The second thing that we have a major piece of work to do in neighborhoods is to assure our own security and uh, police uh, chiefs across the uh, world these days are saying that without active community engagement that the police cannot make you secure, that the majority of security comes from connected individuals who are working together in a neighborhood. The environment is a neighborhood piece of work. Um, it, it is the environmental problem always seems awfully big, but a lot of it has to do with uh, how much waste we create in our own homes and in our neighborhoods and uh, how we transport ourselves. And then there is the economy that we have re major responsibility for. Most people still get their jobs by uh, being referred by somebody who's a friend or a neighbor. So uh, our, our neighborhood is a place that connects people into the larger economy but at the same time most businesses start at the neighborhood level either in a store or in somebody's basement or uh, garage we uh, increasingly can see that we have responsibility for producing uh, some or most of our own food it's much healthier, it is much more environmentally uh, respected because we're not shipping everything from all over the world uh, in order to eat things. So we have work to do in terms of food. Uh, and uh, I know many of you have heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And here, in terms of, of youth, the village is the child raiser if it's doing its work. But if it thinks that schools raise children or isolated families raise children, then it's going to fail because it does take a village to raise a child. And that's one of our functions as a, a neighborhood. And then the last is care. That is the kind of care that uh, involves our helping each other when we are vulnerable or uh, having problems. An institution, a medical system can't produce care, it can produce services. But neighborhoods are made up of people who can care for each other. So those are our seven functions in a neighborhood if we want to live a good life. And if we aren't organized to do those things that we can do in those seven areas, plus any others you want to add, then we're going to have an uh, unsatisfactory life compared to what could happen if we said, yes, we have work to do. Um, so if you have work to do, what are the, the resources that you have that you could use to do that work? And uh, <clears throat> When I was at the university, we did uh, research in 20 cities, two in Canada, eight in the United States, in neighborhoods, mostly older neighborhoods, asking people, can you tell us what people have done together in this neighborhood that made things better? And we collected about 2,000 stories from people telling us about what they did to make things better. 
And then we asked ourselves, well, what did you use to make things better? What did you use to uh, increase your health, security, environment, economy, et cetera? And we found that th there were five basic resources that people use when they uh, wanted to make things better. These are the five resources they use that are in the neighborhood. You don't have to look outside. These are the five basic tools or building blocks would be better. So can I see the next slide? There we are. Now, we, you can call these the five basic building blocks. This is a six here, because we, since that research, we've added the six, so let's say six. Uh, <clears throat> that these are the building blocks for uh, achieving uh, the functional responsibilities that we have. And the first is, and, and I should say, and these are all in your own neighborhood. I'm not talking about something outside the neighborhood. I'm saying, just like the Irish guy said to me, if you just look outside uh, your house in your neighborhood, you, you'll find an awful lot of what you need. So the first thing is the gifts and skills and abilities of individuals who live in a neighborhood. And we've done a lot of research that indicates that everybody believes they have some special abilities, talent that they're willing to share with their neighbors. The second tool is the clubs, groups, and organizations that people belong to in the neighborhood. Because those associations are ways of, of magnifying the gifts of individuals. If, if I have the gift of a good voice for singing, when I get together in a choir and association, my voice gets magnified. And so a very basic asset in every neighborhood is the associations that are there because they are the way we come together to magnify our, our gifts, talents, and abilities. The third asset is the local institutions, the library, the school, the merchant, the uh, <clears throat> park, uh, maybe a police station. The institutions have a role in our having a better neighborhood. Then another asset is the physical space, the land the neighborhood uh, is on. And that space can be an asset doing all kinds of things from creating gardens to creating parks right, to, uh, and other forms of uh, play. The fifth asset is exchange. People in the neighborhood are giving, sharing, uh, bartering, trading, buying and selling. And all of those exchanges are assets in the neighborhood. And finally, there is an asset which is the story of the neighborhood. The story that tells us who we are and what's our way and how do we do things. And that is the cultural framework within which our change efforts take place. Very important, the stories. So these are the building blocks that we can use to fulfill our functions that we talked about earlier. 
the next thing <clears throat> that we know is that if you know what your functions are and you know what your assets are, that still nothing will happen. The assets are the building blocks and they have to be connected or they won't be useful, right? So that if the gifts, talents and abilities of all the people in the neighborhood are connected, all kinds of work and functions can be performed. So this idea of, uh, no, I want to skip this one. I can't, yeah. Um, so how do things get connected? And uh, at the most uh, basic level, uh, they have to be connected by somebody or some group. And uh, <clears throat> what our research has found is that there are people on almost every block who are natural connectors. You don't have to train connectors. They are there, but what you have to find them, <laughs> lift them up, and use their talents for bringing individuals and associations and institutions together. So because connection is so important, we, <clears throat> we did a study of people who are good natural connectors at the local level. And uh, these are their characteristics. Um, first, they tend to be gift-centered. Uh, they're not interested in the empty half of the glass or what's, what's wrong or, or how can we fix people. They are gift-centered, so they see the full half in everybody rather than the empty half. The second thing is they are well-connected themselves. They know a lot of people in the neighborhood individually. They know the kinds of associations that people belong to in the neighborhood. And because uh, of that knowledge, <clears throat> they tend to be people who are trusted. And they also believe that the community is a welcoming place, not a place that you have to live in for 40 years before you're a member of the neighborhood. So the question for each of us, for each of you is, do you know somebody on your block, in your neighborhood, who has these natural skills? Because they are people who are critical if we're going to fulfill our function by using our assets. And the way we use them is by connecting them. Every story that we collected about how people came together to make the neighborhood better, every story yeah, uh, was about assets that were connected that hadn't been connected before, right? We found, uh, for instance, uh, the first asset is an individual and an individual uh, gift. And uh, let's say there you, you find that uh, six people walk every day. So the connector says, well, why don't you walk together? Let me see, I'll, I'll issue the invitation. And if you walk together, you'll get to know each other better. And you know, you can carry a paper bag uh, along with you or a plastic one and, uh, and pick up any little litter or trash that might be there. And in that way, the connector is creating a new association of people who have a common gift of liking to walk. 
So a connector is vital. There can be many connectors. And in the city of Edmonton, they, uh, growing out of one neighborhood, in that neighborhood, uh, the, the residents designated two people to be the connectors. And those people then got everybody to identify the assets and these connectors began to take those assets and put the people together that could make those assets work. So that as more and more blocks had a, a connector on the block right, who brings the assets that are there together, just like the worms, right, and cover the worms. Uh, in in uh, Edmonton, this block by block process of having a connector grew and grew and grew. And so now over half of all the neighborhoods have a connector on a block. And uh, they uh, now have created a whole initiative called the Abundant Community Initiative, which you can uh, look up on the internet. And I believe it has transformed neighborhoods and the city more than anything I have seen that is done by uh, outside institutions. So having this process of, yes, we have work to do. We have, we have the tools to do it. And we have the, connectors who put the pieces together. So those are the three steps of what we then call asset-based community development. Now, there is also uh, a way of uh, getting your assets used that is a little different than how things are normally done. And, and that way is <clears throat> that you start by asking yourself, if it, let's say, say you think you have 10 problems. The first question is, as neighbors, what can we achieve by using our own assets? And why is that the first question? It's not the last question, it's the first question. Because what I learned from the Irishman is you don't know what you need until you know what you have. Let me say it again. Don't start with need surveys. You don't know what you need until you know what you have. I am surrounded by worms. I don't need to go someplace and buy them, right? So the first step is not to ask, what are the problems that um, the not-for-profit or the government or the for-profit institutions can do? We can assure you that that will not mobilize citizens if that's the first question. That's the last question. So if you know what your assets are and you, you know what you're trying to achieve, those functions, then the question is how can we use our assets to achieve those functions? And then the second question is, well, of the 20 things we, we want to do, uh, we can do them with our own assets, 10 of them. You don't need to go outside. But on five of them, we do need some help from outside. So that, so that we need the city to join us. We'll do part of the work. The city can do a part of the work. But this is where cooperation takes place. Second, 
not first. And, and the last is, now that we know what we can do with our assets, what we can do supported by the assets of outside institutions, we will still find that there are <clears throat> things that we want to get done, but we can't do them. But now we know what we really need. We need institutions to take on full responsibility for five of our 20 uh, functions that we're trying to fulfill. So um, th this process is one uh, which activates citizens because it starts by saying, in terms of our well-being, who's the principal producer? Us, right? Well, let's figure out what we can do with what we have. And then let's figure out what we can do with the help of, of out, outside institutions and what we can't do at all and the institutions will have to do. And then we will have a community where each of us is doing the kind of work that we are really able to do. So citizens, no, uh, not that one, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this process activates citizens. If you start at the other end, what are the problems we got here, and what institutions do we need to get to do it? You'll, you, you will never get serious citizen engagement. But if you say, this is a citizen-centered neighborhood or a resident-centered neighborhood, and we are producing, we start here, and then we build out, then you get lots and lots of citizen participation. And that's where a lot of the work of community gets done by those by those people. And you will get much more participation than you will if you start saying, what, what we do is we, we hold neighborhood meetings and the main thing we do at, at the meetings is to figure out who's to blame for our problems and, uh, and then sort of confront the institutions that we think aren't doing their job. That's the last question, not the first one. So what results as well is that you really increase participation. They have participation at the local level in Edmonton that would be the en envy of any other city. And I encourage you to look at their website, the Abundant Community Initiative. And uh, if you want to follow up, uh, you could talk to the leadership of, of that initiative about how you might begin that kind of activity in your own community. Now, when we started out with assets, we are talk, talking about uh, individuals in the neighborhood as being assets. But in fact, a lot of people aren't assets because they are isolated. And uh, uh, this process that we're describing gets maximum participation. So our enemy is isolation. We're going to overcome that barrier to people giving their gifts and participating. So uh, in, uh, in one little town in, um, in Maine, um, I uh, asked the people who were in leadership positions uh, at, a, at a gathering, uh, to talk for a while about who are the isolated people in in their community. You would think there'd be nobody isolated because it's a logging town up in the middle of the woods that everybody would know each other. But they came back with this list. Okay, now can you show the next one? Yeah. 
This is this is what uh, a place that basically has about six thousand five hundred people. What people said who, about the people who were isolated. Now, supposing you said one of the ways we'll get our functions fulfilled is we'll make sure that these people, right, are invited to join in our associations and uh, their and their talents are given so that everybody will be sharing and everybody will be <coughs> participating. Um, and uh, so they went ahead and and set up a group of them who began to contact people from these kind of group, groups and ask them, what do you have that you value that you could contribute to this community? And they said, uh, what gifts do you have that you were born with? Uh, what skills do you have that you've learned? Uh, what uh, uh, what passions do you have that you uh, that led you to to do something, and uh, and 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 finally, um, what is the oh, uh, what do you know that you could share with the young people or adults in your community? those four questions because I don't have a slide for them let me just say them again because they are really a wonderful way of talking with neighbors about what they have as individual contributions so they are not first what what are your most significant gifts and by that I mean things you were born with like you have a good voice so you can sing right i have a bad voice so i can't but the uh if people have a good voice and then you say to them uh, um would you be willing we're thinking of starting a, a, a choir on this block would you be willing to be a, a member of that choir and contribute your, your good voice and what we know, amazingly enough, is that about 90% of the people, once you ask them what is their most significant gift, if they share it, they will say yes. So that tells you a funny thing, that people are waiting to be asked to contribute to every community if you focus on their gifts rather than their problems and their needs right so these isolated people in particular but everybody in the neighborhood are, are people who you could say whose gifts are not recognized whose clubs groups and associations are not recognized or engaged right um, Whose, uh, um, whose passion, uh, uh, where they've done something, <clears throat> have not been appreciated, and who have some special knowledge that could be shared if we really said it takes a village to raise a child. So the key, we think, to getting people to participate is to focus on what they think they have to offer. And if you ask those four questions and after, and after they give you an answer to each, say, would you be willing to share it with other people in the neighborhood? You will find about 90% of the people will say yes, right? So what you know is in a neighborhood is everybody 
with gifts uh, in their house waiting to be invited to give their gift by connecting. So that would be a basic summary of what an asset-based approach is about. Now, finally, I would like to share with you what, what you might find if you're looking at the gifts, skills, uh, <clears throat> passions, and knowledge of local people in a neighborhood. Um, one woman in a neighborhood of eight blocks in uh, a, a, a small city in Wisconsin called Menasha went to 20, 220 households, talked to 330 neighborhoods there, uh, asked them these five, uh, four questions. And this is what she found that they had to offer and would share. And, and I couldn't get them all on one slide. So I have to, uh, can you show the next one? In, uh, look over in the third column, 20 people in that neighborhood want to do something about help. A connector puts those 20 people together. And they take them, and that leads them to say, "Oh, we're ready to take on the function of our health." Right. So next one. But almost every one of those things is more than one person, but they don't know each other. Right? They haven't. They haven't been put together. Uh, there are 10 people who are interested in government policy, but they haven't been connected to make a voice for the neighborhood outside the neighborhood. And is there another one? There we go. So when you are in, next time you go out of your house, Stand on your front porch and say, I am like John McKnight, <laughs> standing in the middle of everything that I need, but I don't see it. It has to be uncovered. That's what a connector and the connectors, the connectors find, do. And that's the process by which you begin to have a vibrant, effective, participating group of people in a neighborhood. So where do you start? You start by recognizing that this, this chart that you're seeing there, that that is telling you people are waiting in your neighborhood to contribute to each other and to the neighborhood. And that that is your single greatest asset as you begin seriously to build a community that, for instance, can raise its children. It will, for this approach will build new associations of people who are giving what they care about and, and building the neighborhood to be a much better place. So once again, let me say that there are institutional people, I'll bet there are a fair number of institutional people who are, are here today, maybe from a city. 
or from a university or from a business or from an agency. Um, any, any of those may be the place where you're from. So you might say, well, what can I do? Well, I, I would say start in your own block, <laughs> but from your job position. The basic framework of thought that will make things useful on your part is first that, that you yourself ask when people come to you to do something, ask the question, what are, uh, what have, what are you going to do in, in this ask? If, if you want this to get done, have you gone through a process where you can figure out what you have to do it? And then, boy, we'd like to help after you do that, right? Second thing is that think always about being a supporter rather than a doer. That you're not the principal actor here. What you're trying to do is to get a group of citizens to be the principal actor, right? And so there are ways that you can precipitate uh, that process. And, uh, and, and that's a very legitimate function to precipitate ways for people to decide what they are going to do. Right? And uh, I've written a paper about that that, I, that I'll mention. Uh, and the third thing I think is that you are uh, you're seeking uh, you're seeking to have people in a neighborhood be the first investor, and that you are a second investor. And when that's the process that you have, neighborhood first neighborhood assets identified, neighborhood assets connected, then functions undertaken, and, and then you get approached. You'll live a lot easier life because instead of selling programs, what you'll learn is what people really want, right? Rather than what you want. So I think if you talk to the leadership, the elected leadership, the council people in Edmonton, as I have, what you'll find is that they, they think that Ed, Edmonton is being transformed by having a citizen-centered rather than an institutional-centered community. And there is so much more citizen engagement, citizen activity, that uh, than, than when nothing was happening to precipitate this kind of activity. That uh, they, they now see how much the work of community needs to be done by community. So uh, that's a, a, a run through <laughs> uh, what asset-based community development is about. And uh, um, who's, uh, who's chairing here? Uh, can, I, can I turn it over to you and see, see if anybody has questions or, or statements, sure. or arguments? <laughs> yes, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, you can put them into the chat. Also, Risha is in the live space, so she can also take questions from the live space and we can put them into the chat. So thank you, John. That was wonderful. Uh, we have a question, I believe. I'm just going to pull it up here. So what potential do you see for asset-based community development work 
to work towards addressing broader systemic issues. And that's uh, from Rachel. Uh, Asset-based community development is not a silver bullet. <laughs> We're gonna say that right up front. <clears throat> it's about making more productive, powerful neighborhoods. Now, one part of that process is people coming together. You remember I pointed out there were what, eight people who were interested in public policy. Uh, uh, you remember, if you remember that, uh, I think it was eight yeah. people said they're, they have a significant gift in trying to deal with public policy. So if you put those people together and you say, you know, there are some systemic problems out there that need to be dealt with as well as our approach, which is fulfilling our function. Why don't you become our systemic uh, analyzers and connectors? You will become a part of our neighborhood organization. You will be the association within our organization that identifies, takes on policy issues, and that if you need to call on us, do so. So I would say that. Uh, that's a way to say that a part of what people have is the ability to deal with the issue that the questioner is asking about. So who are those people who are the system analyst, system changer people? Put them together, connect them, and make them also a part, if you have a larger organization, of that organization. Right, so that you're using their talent, right, as the motivating force for system change. What else? Okay, thank you. So we'll go on to the second question here is from Karen. One of the limitations for people who live in extreme poverty is that they spend a lot of time base meeting basic needs food, shelter, and so on. So they have less time to share their gifts. Do you have any insights or recommendations on how to overcome this? Ah. <clears throat> now this is research that was done in the United States. Right? But generally speaking, if you go to low income neighborhoods and identify the associations, clubs, and groups they have, right? And, and then go to a high income neighborhood and do a, a similar analysis, right? Of what, what they have in the way of association. That low income people tend to have more association than do upper income people. And the reason for that, I think, is because if you can't depend so much on outside institutions, you tend <coughs> to organize yourself to take on more functions. So high income people think anything they want can be bought with money. And so they are like a desert in terms of associational life. But in low-income people, in those neighborhoods, they have um, lots and lots of associations. And uh, just before we close, I'll mention how, you, uh, where you can look to see the research that we've done on associations in low-income neighborhoods or in rural communities. Okay, thank you. So we have another question here from Brian Hutchings. So Brantford is a city with 42 neighborhood associations, which is a huge start. Can we use these predefined neighborhoods to inventory our assets in each of them? 
Are there, so that's the first question. And then the second part is, are there best practices for cities being leveraged to catalyst the neighborhoods? Read the second one again, I didn't hear it. Right. Are there best practices for cities being leveraged to catalyst the neighborhoods? And I will admit that I can't clarify that any further, but Brian, <laughs> if you wanted to, you can certainly add. Okay, so say the first question again. Okay, so the first question was that Brantford has 42 neighborhood associations. Yeah. Can we use these predefined neighborhoods to inventory their assets right. in each of them? Yeah. I, uh, I really would encourage you to contact the people in Edmonton because Edmonton uh, has, uh, I think it's 115 na designated neighborhoods with an organization in each. So that they started with that kind of a structure. I think an awful lot of their neighborhood organizations on, on sports, to tell you the truth. But they have these neighborhood organizations. And this process, this path that I described to you has grown from the bottom up into the neighborhood organizations. And there, there were a few places where people were uh, a little hesitant, people in the neighborhood organization leadership but most places it was thought of as a very good way of getting more participation, more members for their group. And so I would, I would urge you to, to talk to the people because they are in exactly that situation in Edmonton. They've got groups, lots of them, 115, and they are growing this into those groups. Right. The second question is, how can we leverage something? Is that it? Uh, the second part was. Yeah, I'll um, do it, Chair. I can do it, Chair. Yeah. Yes, thank you. John, it's Brian Hunchings. I'm the city manager, CEO. So, how can you use us as a city to leverage these neighborhoods? Like, what 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 best practices are out there to uh, use the city to leverage all these community uh, associations and networks? Yeah. Um, I, I have written a paper uh, for people like, uh, like you, <laughs> uh, which is how to precipitate, how to be a precipitator of ever increasing citizen functions, right? And one example that most people know, and, it's, and it was started by, by one of our, the faculty of our Asset-Based Community Development Institute. Uh, and it is that in, uh, he, he was the assistant city manager of Savannah, Georgia. And he had uh, blocks of money, block grants, uh, to use to try to make things better. And so he knew how to make things better and he <laughs> took his block grants and uh, set up programs and most everything was done by, by the city. And he noticed after 10 years that there had been very little change. And so he decided that what he had left to do was to see, could citizens in a neighborhood do anything? How could he get them to do something? Because what he had done with his millions of dollars had made much difference. And so uh, what he did is he took out of the budget a little money and, he, and uh, in the lowest income quarter section of, uh, of Savannah, right? Uh, he sent every household a letter and said, um, I, or we, the city, re really appreciate all the things that you do to make things better in the neighborhood. And we, we decided we want to help if we can. And so if you would like this summer, he did this in the spring, if you would like this summer, 
to take on an initiative that will make your block better. We'd like to see if we could support your idea, support your idea. So we have up to a hundred dollars that we could put in to assist you in your uh, initiative. And so just write, don't write more than one page, write, write a page of what you'd like to do on the neighborhood and get two other people or a local association to sign the letter to. And to then indicate if you need any money at all or if you need some of the $100, right? So he sent that to the household of a quarter section, the, the lowest income section of uh, that city. And he got 80 responses, uh, which was just a, a little more than the number of blocks in the neighborhood. And, um, and so, he, he said, one of the things I noticed is nobody asked for the hundred dollars. They asked if they asked for nothing or they asked for for thirty eight dollars and seventy two cents because he said uh, they they were going to make a flag unique for each family on the block. And uh, they use the money to buy uh, the material for a flag and some thread that, that, where they could make designs of icons for that family, right? And uh, so at the end of the summer, he invited everybody who had participated in this initiative. And uh, it, it, it ended up that there were between three and 400 people who had been activated as a result of his little stimulus, he precipitated. <laughs> and uh, I was with him at the, uh, at the event, the dinner. He had, so he had a dinner for these 400 people in the finest hotel in Savannah, right? And, uh, uh, and he said to me, as he looked out, he said, I now know the real leadership in our neighborhood. These are the people who could connect people in ways with their resources to make things better. And I'm going to stop acting as though people from agencies who come in and bitch and moan about the neighborhood. I'm not going to be focused there. I'm going to be focused on the full half. I'm going to precipitate, right, people to begin to take on new functions. So the next morning, he got all these three to 400 people together <clears throat> and, and uh, broke them up. Oh, first of all, everybody had to have a little uh, display of what they had done so that people from 82 neighborhoods could learn what everybody had done. So you got a whole set of new ideas of what could be done by just seeing what had been done by all those neighborhoods. And then he said, what I wanna do is to recognize that $100 may not go too far. So, I, so if you need up to $500 uh, for what you're gonna do this year, uh, let me know and uh, uh, we'll, we'll arrange the, the fact that you get that, although you can't use it for yourself. You can't pay yourself. It has to be used in fulfilling the initiative that takes on a function within the neighborhood. And uh, this man's name, the assistant city manager, it was uh, Henry Moore. He unfortunately passed away way too young. And uh, he, he kept growing and growing and growing the city's base by precipitating activities with really little bits of money, right? 
uh, now th they they call this then the grants for blocked program. And it has been the renewal basis for uh, for that city. In uh, let me say in Edmonton, they took uh, there was a man who started all of this in his own neighborhood, what they're doing in Edmonton. And so it grew and grew and grew, and so many neighborhoods were now activated and uh, engaging uh, the city uh, around things that the city could support them on, that they hired the, the, the man who is, uh, uh, who, is uh, who started this whole thing as the person head of the Department of Neighborhoods in that city. And so the city is helping in that way because the founder who is deeply appreciative of how you precipitate rather than how, how you take over or how you get them to do what you want them to do uh, in, in charge. So th those are two examples of what I call precipitation. And, and I would add to that convening. I think it is uh, often uh, a situation where convening is something that uh, municipality can do, but with a hint from a neighborhood when you convene, do not include any institutions at the beginning. Only neighborhood people start there in your convening, right? Collaboration is the second step. But if you start with collaboration, so you have, have 20 people from the neighborhood in the room and 10 agencies, the agencies will control the whole thing. They have all the power, authority, and money. So as a convener, respect that you're trying to enhance a citizen-centered organization at the local level. And you don't do that by starting with institutions that say, we'll fix you. Right? You do that by saying, how can you fix things that are going on here? And then, who else can help? Okay. I, um, are we, uh, how, we're going to end in five minutes. Is that right? Well, yes. Okay. Um, Cause if, I got some things I can tell you about for follow up. Well, actually we have one more question in the chat and we haven't asked the live room if there are any questions, John. So maybe we could, there is one more question. I think it's, very important, but first let's go to the um, live room and see if there was any questions from any of the folks there. A lot of people are here. Um, I have, are, is there a question over here? No, I've been waiting for a while. Oh, you're here. <laughs> awesome. Would you like to share a thought? Only if others do. Yeah. Like to hear okay, so I've done a lot of um, community work in Toronto, and some of the work I've done, for example, was an International Women's Day event for the homeless people and in shelters. And the agencies were all involved, and then there was a meeting, so there were it was a day to off, uh, th there were two events, sorry, I'm mixing them up. Um, what was offered is people from spas, healers, massage therapists showed up to give the homeless women a spa day, a treat day. And then the agencies, are. we had a meeting on how we were going to gift these volunteers who volu donated their services for the day. And they wanted to do a t-shirt and a mug and I like, 
<laughs> I'm like, seriously, I don't think these people need another T-shirt or mug. <laughs> like, how can we think of these people and how can we, you know, offer them something thoughtful? And so then even, even when it comes down to the gift that you offer to somebody donating their services. So I ended up doing a calligraphy scroll and, and bought beautiful journals for each of these people. And each year, like, we made a thoughtful gift as opposed to just another mug or T-shirt that they're going to shove away or take to, you know, Salvation Army eventually. <laughs> the other part was that they had David and David catering, which is super expensive. The agency people were shocked because the food disappeared within an hour. <laughs> people were bagging it up, and I'm like, well, these people don't get to see this kind of food normally. Like, and But they were used to only seeing these people as clients in their offices, and they weren't actually out there with them on the street a lot of times. Okay. So I just wanted to share that and, and see yeah. if there's anybody else has anything to offer around that. Oh, you're Brigitte. That's a great. Uh, That's awesome. Thanks, Brigitte. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Thank you for sharing. Did anyone want to add to what Brigitte was saying insights in terms of again that you know there's probably lots of us in the room that have used the word client before some of the things that were standing out just you know and just listening to you and and even that that language you know around client as someone to be fixed versus citizen i think is critical and how do we as agencies just plain and simple get out of the way and start at that that list that john started with early earlier just starting with citizens and their gifts first mm -hmm. anybody else from the room before i think there was one more terry you said that was a kind of a critical question online of a quiet room thank you brigida for sharing that was great john did you want to add to that or terry did, did are you thumbs up no I'm, I'm, one more question? I'm, I'm ready to hear the last yes. one <laughs> okay the last question is from Rachel again. She just brought up a really good point um, from hearing. So basically just wondering about the value of those that are also complaining to understand where we might have inequities or harms that are occurring from our work. So just really, she was just asking the question because it's come up that if people are complaining that maybe, you know, they might not be the folks that we're focusing on, but she's just saying that those folks also have value possibly with a question mark so that we can assess our harms and inequities. Those people, meaning the people in the agencies? I think you were referring to people in agencies when you were talking about that, but she, I think she's just referring to people complaining in general and probably not <laughs> within the agencies, probably within the communities. Right, right. Um, I ran into uh, a neighborhood organization some years ago <clears throat> that they they met monthly and and they would uh, <clears throat> and the chair would open it and the chair would say at the beginning of every meeting, "We are not here to bitch and moan." Anybody who wants to bitch and moan, go someplace else. Isn't that interesting? That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is unlocking the tremendous abilities and talent of the people in our neighborhood. And we'll never do that by bitching and moaning because that points to somebody else. Who's to blame? Right. So I, I just think that a pretty constant effort to say we are powerful people here if we get together and begin to realize what's all around us that we can use. And then we can turn to the city and say, we invested first. Will you come in as a second investor? I think that process at any level of people's uh, income is one that builds a sense of self-worth. And I suppose 
under underlying all of this is that in low-income communities, they're the victims of a culture that says you're unworthy, you're not worth anything. And the asset-based approach engages people by saying you're worth everything. We are coming together to be powerful once again. Right. So let me uh, let me at the end here. I'd like to give you a few references of things uh, if you wanted to follow up. At least two. <clears throat> the first is that we have a website, which is. Um, abcdinstitute.org, I, I think. If it's not org, it's com. <laughs> One or the other, right? Um, and there you will see <clears throat> tools galore, including a lot of publications. And um, these, these publications are targeted to various actors and various uh, associations. And so if you are, for instance, working from a church community, you'll find that we have publications on how does ABCD work through a church, right? If you are uh, with a police department, we have a series of videos about, by many of them, interviewing police chiefs about what it is that they see communities do to make themselves secure, right? So look it over, it is hardly an issue. <laughs> Uh, or a constituency that you won't find uh, publications in that in that list. And uh, for Brian, the city manager, uh, let me say that one of those publications is called "Leading by Stepping Back," and it, it's written in the main by Henry Moore, the assistant city manager, who initiated and precipitated one of the most significant community improvement programs in the United States, right? But how did he do it? He stepped back and he said, how can I support you in becoming productive, right? And incidentally, he did tell me that he got 80, uh, 80 applications Right, and if if you gave each of them a hundred dollars, what would that come to? Eight thousand dollars. Am I right? Anybody know mathematics? I <laughs> and I think eight thousand dollars. He said I had spent about twenty million dollars over the years in that neighborhood, and it steadily declined. I spent $8,000. He didn't spend that much. He didn't, nobody asked for all hundred, let's say $6,000 and revived the neighborhood. So if you think about the economics of, of this whole thing, it is incredible what a difference it makes. So at any rate, Look at abcdinstitute.org okay, and look through all the publications, tools, uh, and see if, uh, <clears throat> if you don't find things that are going to be really helpful to you. Uh, the second thing is that I have a website, which is hard to remember. It is johnmcknight.org, 
or Tom, I can't remember, or I think. And in it, <clears throat> I I write for our our stewards, the faculty of the ABCD Institute, sixty people. Every month, <clears throat> a piece about neighborhoods and neighborhood change and and new things we're learning. So if you go to that website, johnmcknight.org, you'll see learnings, and there. Uh, there are 44 of them by now, and they're going to come out in a book uh, this summer, and that may that may be of some use. And uh, then the last thing is to look on the internet at the Abundant Community Initiative in Edmonton, which is fulfilling everything on the path to building neighborhoods better than almost any city I know. <clears throat> and the director is a man, the guy who started it, the director of the neighborhood is uh, Howard Lawrence. So I wanna thank you for spending your morning uh, with me, you probably have something else you might might have wanted to do. So I appreciate your time and your commitment. Uh, you can uh, reach me uh, at uh, at my email, uh, which uh, if you look on our website under faculty, you'll see my email, um, and uh, I I'd be glad to counsel with any groups that are going to uh, take uh, this kind of a, a series of steps. So have a wonderful three days. And uh, I, I wish I could be there with you, literally. <laughs> we, so. we definitely wish that too, John. And actually, just before you go, we are going to do breakout sessions um, in person and online. But we have one more question just about what would the contact information be for the people in Edmonton? How would folks get in contact with people you referenced? I, I think <clears throat> you just type in the internet, Edmonton Abundant Community Initiative. And that page will come up and I'm sure it shows the telephone number and the, the email. Excellent. And thank you, everybody. I hope you're able to get down all of John's wonderful um, resources. I'm sorry they didn't all get in the chat, um, but we can certainly share them amongst ourselves after this. Um, and we have lots of thinking to do in our breakout groups. John, thank you for sharing the stories and giving us so much to, to think about for the next three days. We really appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Keep on being Canada. <laughs> We got thank a lot you. to learn from you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So I am just putting some questions up in the chat for the folks online. I think we'll probably separate into two groups now um, the folks online and then the folks that are in the live room. And for the folks that are here online with me, uh, Zila is actually going to moderate some questions that I'm going to put into the chat right now and then break you up into groups of three to discuss those questions. So everyone should see that Tara already wrote some questions into the chat and you'll be broken up into groups soon. Uh, and I'll just read out the questions. Also, what is coming up for you or what has most struck you over the past hour? And what declaration of possibility can you make that has the power to inspire you and transform the community? <clears throat> 